All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Second Chronicles chapter 30, and we're going to talk about the great Passover. So you'll remember that uh, Hezekiah, right, in his first month, he reestablished proper temple worship, an accomplishment that brought great rejoicing. And in chapter 30, uh, you'll remember that his father had carried on warfare against the northern kingdom, and many of those from Judah had been taken captive. And you might think that Hezekiah would have come to the throne with a spirit of vengeance in his heart and with a spirit of getting even. But you'll notice that after he had opened up the temple of God, restoring the worship of God, and giving his own public testimony, that he sends an invitation to the northern kingdom to come and worship God. All right, so let's take the five first five verses here. You're going to get the letter of invitation to the tribes of Israel are invited to celebrate the Passover. All right. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time, because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly. So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all of Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, and that they should come to keep the Passover to the Lord, God of Israel, at Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. So, the timing of this invitation is somewhat hard to precisely determine. It seems to have happened when Israel was defeated and prostrate under Assyria, yet perhaps before the kingdom as a whole had been depopulated through exile. Therefore, this invitation actually went out to the remnant that had, up to this point, escaped the exile in Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 6. So in all probability, this Passover was observed before the final passing of the northern kingdom into captivity. And any such compliance had been prohibited during the two centuries that had followed Jeroboam's division of the Solomon Empire in Second Chronicles chapter 30 verse 5 and verse 26 and First Kings chapter 12 verses 27 through 28. But now King Hosea's capital in Samaria was subject to Assyrian siege. And you can see Second Chronicles chapter 30 verse 6 and Second Kings chapter 17 verse 5 for that. And the northern ruler was powerless to interfere. So, to keep the Passover, this great feast celebrated the great and glorious deliverance of God on, be- on Israel's behalf in the days of the Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. It was a deliberate, emblematic reminder of the central act of redemption in the Old Testament, the deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Communion is likewise an emblematic reminder of the central act of redemption of the New Testament and the Bible as a whole. The, non, the long neglect of Passover among the tribes of Israel would be like a church that had not celebrated the Lord's table in a long, long time. And so Jesus Christ is the ultimate Passover lamb, who by his own body and blood established a new covenant in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Just as Hezekiah's congregation were cleansed and healed, Christians are made clean by their Passover sacrifice, except that Jesus Christ's sacrifice is the ultimate and unrepeatable Passover, right? One and done. So, had they agreed to keep the Passover in the second month, so normally the Passover was kept in the first month, in Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 through 5 for that. However, there were special circumstances under which Passover could be kept in the second month, in Numbers chapter 9, verses 5 through 14, because they could not keep it at a regular time. Here, under Hezekiah, they kept it in the second month. Hezekiah, therefore, and his counselors thought that they might extend that to the people at large because of the delay necessarily occasioned by the cleansing of the temple, which was granted to individuals in such cases as the above. And the result showed that they had not mistaken the mind of the Lord upon the subject. So, and they hadn't done this for a long time. So even though the Passover was one of the three feasts that deserved special emphasis in Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 through 17, it had not been celebrated for a long time. Hezekiah was dedicated to righting the wrong in this case. 
All right, so anticipation of what might have been the first Passover of his reign, Hezekiah sent out invitations throughout all of Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms, including even Ephraim and Manasseh, to encourage the faithful to attend. Some of the people in those two northern tribes had apparently not been taken captive by Assyria. And this feast was usually held in the first month of the religious calendar, and you can see Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. But Hezekiah had not been able to recruit sufficient priestly personnel that early, nor had the people been able to arrive from distant points. So authority for observing the Passover in the second month instead of the first is given in Numbers chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. And so, an announcement was sent out from Beersheba to Dan, the southernmost and the northernmost cities in Judah and Israel, with the expectation of a great attendance. All right, verses 6 through 9, the letter to the tribes. Then the runners went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and his leaders and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And do not be like your fathers and your brethren who trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, so that he gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord, and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctioned forever. And serve the Lord your God, that with fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you." For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive, so that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. All right, let's look at this. Children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. All right, so the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen, and all that remained after the exile to the Assyrians was a remnant of you who have escaped. Yet Hezekiah still believed in the concept of the children of Israel, those of the tribes of Israel descended from the great patriarchs. So in the history of the divided kingdoms, there were some attempts to reunify by force, but these came to nothing. In comparison with previous failures, this incident shows that the only really effective approach to unity has to be based on the principle of faithful worship. And the good of our brethren in other kingdoms must also be minded here. And he says, do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were. This was especially relevant as the latter went to the remnant of the northern kingdom. Generally speaking, they had neglected the Jerusalem Passover for a long time. To be stiff-necked means to be difficult. And Hezekiah knew that the poor remnant of Israel were in great affliction. He therefore pressed them to repentance, whereby men return to God, as by sin they run from him. Hezekiah thought it was good striking while the iron was hot here. And he tells them to return to the Lord. So this letter of invitation promised two things if the remnant of Israel would return to the Lord and obediently celebrate this Passover in Jerusalem. First, under God's blessing, it would uh, go well with those already taken captive by the Assyrians. And second, God would restore the northern kingdom and allow them to come back to this land. So these promises were based on the eternal principle of God's character, that he will not turn his face from you if you return to him. God promises to draw near to those who draw near to him. Right, so Hezekiah's proclamation was to the effect that those Israelites who had escaped Assyrian deportation should repent of their sins and turn to the Lord, submit to him, and serve him. And uh, that they should express the genuineness of their contrition by assembling at the temple in Jerusalem, right? Come to the sanctuary to celebrate the Passover. This is one of the three annual festivals which every adult male was supposed to attend in Jerusalem in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. And by assembling for the Passover, they would bring God's forgiveness and could even expect the return of their captured loved ones. Their repentance would divert God's fierce anger, for he is gracious and compassionate. All right, take verses 10 through 12. You're going to get the reaction to the letter in both Israel and Judah. So, the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but they laughed at them and mocked them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also, the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and of the leaders at the word of the Lord. So, 
They laughed at him and mocked him. Mostly the reception among the remnant of the northern kingdom was not very warm. Uh, reflecting the same kind of attitude of heart that brought the kingdom as a whole into exile to begin with. And the people of the northern kingdom laughed at and mocked the messengers who invited them to this great Passover in Jerusalem. And we note that there was no rational argument against this invitation. It was all opposed with the simple laughter and mocking. For the frivolous and the simple-minded, these replaced serious thought. And Josephus said that these Israelites thus invited slew both the messengers and those prophets also that exhorted them to go up. So, nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came. So happily, there was a remnant of the remnant that responded. Remember that, remnant of the remnant. And I think that's true of the Christian body today. I think there's only very few um, a remnant that responded to the message and came from the former northern kingdom. And far more northerners participated than previously. And the recent fall of the northern kingdom in 722 BC meant that Jerusalem now offered the only alternative for corporate worship of the Lord. And the response among the peoples and villages of Judah was entirely different. God gave them singleness of heart to obey the command of the Lord and their king. Right, so the message was spurned except for a few that came from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun, and Ephraim, and Issachar. All right, let's take verses 13 through 17 where preparations and sacrifices are made. All right, now many people, a very great assembly, gathered at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. They arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and they took away all the incense altars and cast them into the brook Kidron. Then they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the fourteenth day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought the burnt offerings to the house of the Lord. They stood in their place according to their custom, according to the law of Moses, the man of God, and the priests sprinkled the blood received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not sanctified themselves. Therefore, the Levites had charge of the slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who was not clean to sanctify them to the Lord. So, this was a very great assembly gathered for Passover uh, in generations. And not only had the Passover been neglected in Judah, the southern kingdom, for many years, but this Passover also included those from the remnant of the northern tribes who responded to the invitation. So, they arose, took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. Let's look at this. These were either altars to pagan gods or unauthorized altars to the true God. Both were prohibited. And as a demonstration of preparation for this great Passover, the city was cleansed of all idolatrous or unauthorized worship. So that we must first cast the baggage into the brook and then come to the Lord's Supper. Right? And of course, they slaughter the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the second month. This shows the Passover being celebrated according to the scriptural commands, right? Allowing for the celebration of Passover in the second month, according to Numbers chapter 9, verses 5 through 14. They took care to honor and obey in their celebration of this important feast. Remember, obedience. So, in addition, of course, the people of Judah came with united purpose and commitment to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This seven-day festival followed immediately after the Passover. And you can look back at Exodus chapter 12, verses 11 through 20, and Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 through 8. So, indicative of the people's dedication was their disavowal once more of heathen altars, uh, discarding them into the Kidron Valley. And you can look at chapter 15, verse 16, chapter 29, at verse 16 for that as well. And when the priests and the Levites saw the dedication of the throngs of the people, they were chagrined and quickly consecrated themselves by burnt offerings for the service of the Passover. And ordinarily, the lady could offer their own Passover lambs in sacrifice back in Exodus 12, verse 3. But because of the laxity of many of the Israelites in those apostate days, especially in the northern kingdom, they were ceremonially unclean and thus could not slaughter their own Passover lambs. All right, verses 18 through 20, where God is merciful to the ignorant worshipers. So, for a multitude of the people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. All right. 
So, multitude of the people hadn't cleansed themselves. Let's look at this. This multitude seems to have mostly come from the remnant of the northern tribes who would naturally be ignorant about how to properly prepare for the Passover, right? It was a motley crowd which assembled, and the multitudes of the people were utterly ignorant of the divine arrangements for preparation. Hezekiah's tenderness was manifested in the pity he felt for these people and in the prayer he offered on their behalf. Do we do the same thing today? This largeness, this largeness of heart is always characteristic of men who are really in fellowship with God, for it is in harmony with the heart of God. And uh, they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. And we would expect that this would result in a great punishment or judgment against them. Instead, Hezekiah prayed for them, asking the good Lord to provide atonement. This is the Old Testament now. And in response, the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. This shows the wonderful and warm mercy of God. By the letter of the command, the people deserve judgment for the disobedient. Yet God showed his mercy and goodness to those who had prepared their heart to seek God. Right? Prepared their heart to seek God. Though in ignorance, they did not do it all according to the commandments. Right? They didn't know yet. Their heart was in the right place. And unaccustomed to temple usage, strangers to the temple rites, they had participated in the festivities of this great Passover without submitting first to the necessary ab- um, abulations. And their heart was prepared to seek God, and they were proud of the great past. They desired to stand right with the Lord God of their fathers, but they were sadly ignorant and careless. And the only thing to be done was to pray that their ignorance and negligence might be forgiven. You know, much like a new Christian today. They're not going to know everything that there is to know and be perfect right off the bat. They're going to be ignorant. That's what First and Second Corinthians really hams home, uh, hammers home. All right, so you may not understand doctrine, creed, or rites, but be sure to seek God. No splendid ceremonial nor rigorous etiquette can intercept the seeking soul. And their pattern of preparing to receive the Passover is instructive for those who come to the communion table, especially those who feel unworthy to partake of communion. Right? They forgot their differences and came together as one people. They removed their idols. Remember that. They removed their idols. All idol worship. They prepared their hearts, and their sins and ignorance were confessed, and they prayed. Right, So nonetheless, they did eat of the Passover, even though they were ritually disqualified. And when Hezekiah realized this, he prayed on their behalf that God might be more impressed with the sincerity of their hearts and motives than with the manners of just the mere ceremonialism. And the essence of God's grace is seen in his favorable response to the king's prayer. During the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed the Passover, the people praised the Lord with joy. <clears throat> All right, verses 21 through 22, you're going to get worship, teaching, and fellowship. So, the children of Israel were present in Jerusalem, kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. So, There was a special gladness for these who had came from the northern tribes, and they had never before experienced such obedient and joyful worship, where they praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord. And the gathering at this Passover was not only given to worship, but also to teaching. It was helpful and good at all times. One might say it was urgently needed with the presence of the northern tribes. This remnant of the remnant of the northern tribes came to God in ignorance, and in his mercy God received them. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verses 18 through 20. Yet, God didn't want to leave them in ignorance, so he used the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. Are you being taught good knowledge of the Lord? Or are you just getting cherry-picked verses and opinions about it? Are we actually getting the message of God's word? Are you studying? All right, so it is a fine and expressive character given to these men. They taught the good knowledge of God to the people. This is the great work, or should be so, of every Christian minister. They should convey the knowledge of God to the people by which they may be saved. That is, the good knowledge of the Lord. And so they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession. The third component to their gathering was fellowship. They shared some of the same food, the same relationship with God, demonstrated by the peace offerings, and the same need for Him, God, demonstrated by their confession and sin. Making confession. 
So, either one, confessing their sins, which work was to accompany many of their sacrifices, of which see Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5, or chapter 16, verse 21, or rather two, confessing God's goodness or praising of God, which oft goes under his name, right? As in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8, and verse 24, which also seems to be more proper work for this season of joy. So the essence of God's grace is seen in his favorable response to the king's prayer, right? The people praise the Lord with joy here. And let's take verses 23 through 27, the resulting joy and answered prayer. Then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days, and they kept it another seven days with gladness. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, gave to the assembly a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep, and the leaders gave to the assembly a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep, and a great number of the priests sanctified themselves. The whole assembly of Judah rejoiced, and also the priests and the Levites, all the assembly that came from Israel, the sojourners who came from the land of Israel, and those who dwelt in Judah. And there was a great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven. Great passage. So this was a remarkable and wonderful response to their experience of worship, teaching, and fellowship. They wanted to make the necessary sacrifices to continue the feast for another week, and they did it with gladness. How many people are ready to leave Sunday, Sunday worship service? And there is no indication in the text that they offered more Passover lambs or continued eating unleavened bread, which belonged to that specific seasons of these feasts. The emphasis is on their continuation of worship, teaching, and fellowship. And this was substantially supported by King Hezekiah, who gave a thousand bullocks and seven thousand sheep, which generosity is more considerable because it was in the beginning of his reign when he found the royal... uh, (laughs) royal chamber, the bank systems, uh, exhausted and empty, and when he had been at a great expense about the cleansing and refitting of the temple, and making preparations for this great feast. And since those days, there had not been a Passover in Jerusalem so widely and enthusiastically celebrated, right? That's how dark things had been, right? Since the time of Solomon, the son of David, there had been nothing like this. That's sad, but it's a good passage, right? Good king, good passage, good times. So the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people. So according to Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, it was the duty of the priest to bless the people with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And as the priests obeyed this command, their voice was heard even to heaven, and the people were indeed blessed. The phrase, the priests and the Levites, may here be rendered as the Levitical priests, since it was the priest whom Moses had authorized to bless the people. So in fact, all the people were so caught up in their devotion to joy in the Lord, they extended the festivities for another week. Uh, The king was impressed and his officials, so they provided at their own expense a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep and goats for sacrifice by the people. And the officials also provided a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep and goats. And since the days of Solomon, the chronicler related, there had never been anything like this. And of course it ends in verse 27 that God heard from heaven his dwelling place. You can see 2 Chronicles chapter 6 verse 21, verse 30, verse 33, verse 39, Psalm 11 verse 4, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. And uh, God of course blessed their outpouring of praise and consecration. Okay. That ties up chapter 30. In chapter 31, we're going to talk about temple worship is going to be reestablished by Hezekiah. Thank you for joining me.